Eric, do you want to, maybe we can just tackle some of this together and just talk through, talk through maybe some of the tech problems and then we can maybe show some examples. So I think there's lots of different philosophies to, well, like maybe philosophies is too broad a word actually, but like technical approaches to building these recommenders. We were just going to show a few today and how tech can, can enable them. The sort of broad problem that we're looking at is recommending a, from a relatively small number of options when you have a fair number of data about the people you're recommending to. The, I guess, most commonly studied or like most commonly case studied recommend the systems of say Amazon and Netflix are more of a situation where you have huge numbers of things that you could potentially offer and very sparse data, which is quite a different scenario. And we found in the like fight like insurance, banking, telco sectors, it's actually more relevant to the case that I was talking about where you actually don't have a million things that you could potentially show the client you have 50 and you actually know quite a lot about the client and you know about how people have reacted to those offers in the past so it's a slightly different you've well no, you've, you've got a fairly different sort of modeling approaches for those two problems so we're going to look at the, the one where there's not as many things being recommended if you guys are interested in the other approach like i said that's probably the most case studied thing so you just google how some of the Amazon or, or Netflix problems, I'm sure you can find a lot of information on it. So we just thought we'd step through how the process would work. The first thing would be you need to actually get your, so there's, there's the model training piece and then there's the model deployment piece, right? So the first thing is getting some data. You can ingest some data that we have from a CSV file and you know, you can ingest that data. We've already done so, but that's how you could do it. And take a look at that data. And obviously, there's all the, you can see it has things like education, language, the client's balance, their personality. So we've added some behavioral features, the segment that they're in, their marital status, their gender. So those sort of factors. So some, some like balance being more real time, others being more sort of fixed demographics. So we're not going to through, go through the exploratory data analysis piece today. Assume that has already happened. Obviously, it's very important and you need to do it, but let's take this as a sort of prepared data set. So what we then want to do is build our models. And there's three different sort of approaches that we wanted to talk about today. For the first two, so the first thing you need to do is create your feature store from that, that data you've ingested. And we can store the way that we do that so that it's easy to repeat. And once you, you need to say what sort of types your data has and all that sort of stuff, once you put it into a more structured form for the, the prediction. And then there's, like I said, three, different philosophies that we're going to look at. The first is you just train a, you, you have your data set. If you say you've got 10 offers, like we have in our data set, you have a row for each client and the most recent offer and like whether they, and the offers that they've taken up. So like the most recent, the offer, yeah, either the most recent or just the offers that they have taken up. I think our, and this one is just the offers that they've taken up. So you have one column as your response column and you train a model to a multinomial predictor to say which offers the uh, client cyclist most likely to, to engage with. The second approach is to train 10 different models. So instead of just training that, that one multinomial, you instead train 10 different models on a binary, 10 binary response columns and rank the offers using the results of those 10 models. Then with both of those, you need to decide uh, if and how you want to put them into sort of a, team, a testing framework. How do you want to, do you just want to always use the model results or do you want to have some degree of randomization and how do you want to do that? Um, and then the last thing that we're going to look at is doing a multi on banded Thompson sampling to, you know, as a sort of different philosophy. So you sort of store a distribution associated with each offer with a bit of segmentation and offer people, make people offers based on that. And then, I mean, depending on how things go, and if you're interested, we can talk about some sort of more 
some approaches that combine the the two sort of Asian Thompson sampling approach using linear regression so that you can include the details of the features, which is something we're working on at the moment. So for our first two, let's let's first start with our multinomial one. So we have our our multinomial training data. We want to pass that into our feature store. So we have our multinomial feature store and we can then split the testing and training set. So we can say we want to split it into an 80, an 80 20 ratio. Um, and you can see those two, two splits there. So then we have our data that we can actually put into our machine learning framework. So we're going to use an auto ML approach for this. So we'll set up our, our predictor. So we give it some descriptions. So the name, the description, what are we trying to do? What is the model ID? which data set do we want to use? So that's the frame that we just set up. What approach do we want to follow? So you can choose a whole bunch of individual algorithms, but just for, for the sake of this, we're going to do the auto ML. You then say what category it is, and then you can store versioning information. Let's maybe do this as a new, a new version. So we can store that. So we're going to say over five is you train and save that and then all that you do is generate your model and that you know will run for a while and you can see what the the results are as things go along obviously that can take a little while so i'll just show you one that we ran previously So yeah, you can see all the models get created, they get created, the accuracy levels, and you can choose, so say, and you can, if you want to dig into these models in more detail, and you shouldn't see the confusion matrices and variable importances and, and all of that sort of stuff. And then you decide which of these models you're actually going to want to use to make your multinomial prediction. And you'll go ahead and and save that model. So we then have our like multinomial recommender model working. And then Jay, I don't know if you want to talk about, so that's the training piece. I don't know if you want to just talk about the deployment piece for this, for this model. Yeah, so what will happen from a deployment piece and we can, in a follow-up session, maybe set up one that goes all the way into production. When you say deploy there, the model gets pushed into the runtime environment. That's our client pulse responder scoring environment. And oh, the other thing you could do is if you click test model there, maybe to show them what it looks like, you click test model and you click default. What it does, it generates you a default, just kind of like an entry view that you can just try out to see what the scores look like when you, you know, want to, want to see what's happening with your predictor just by eyeballing it. But then once you're done with this, you then go to your projects and you define a project that will then do, you know, the rest of the work for you. So in this case, yeah, you can just see there, it, 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 it just returns all the in this case, a label and, a, and the scores and the probabilities of this particular this particular model. So that means that up until this point, the issue around the no data and many other questions we had discussed earlier, these things that we've showed you so far almost need to be out of the box. You want to do these things pretty quickly so you can solve some of the more complex some of the more complex problems. And that means that when you go to projects and we want to configure a new a new recommender, let's go to deployment. I think first. I've, I might have. Let me see if I've got one there or. Oh. And you just go to recommender. There is a generic one there that you can maybe just show everybody. This one. Yeah, I just use recommender. That's a very generic, a generic one yes. that I think is a good one to look at. So what you can do, yeah, you'll then define what kind of criteria you want to have in place when you productionize your model. So what will happen is that there, there where you've got prediction model is you will tell it which model or models to load. And at the moment we've got a limitation of uh, 64 models per scoring engine. We're busy testing at the moment a framework that will get you thousands of models at a time. So the idea is that, especially if you've got smaller models, you'll be able to load two, three million models. And, and you can then have a pipeline that automatically generates them throughout the day in real time and your models get, get, get reproduced. And if any one of them fail, you then go to your base model. That is the one that is trained on longer periods of time if you don't have a model, say, for a customer or for a particular situation. 
So that is one of the ways in which we see that the no data to build and then how do you anticipate things. And, and I think also what we would do with the concept of confidence levels and, and the consistency issues is that we want to make sure that when those models get trained, that you can do that continuously. So that means model drift and data drift and a lot of those kind of issues, the idea is to get those to, to really get away from that kind of problem. Then the model selector is if you wanted to use some data point to decide what to do. Um, at the moment, the selector is mostly for kind of discrete values. We're working on a continuous view as well. So you could say anything over this value or over this category or in this category, use model A versus B versus C. And that means that you can at some point get to a point where that model selector is a customer number. So that means it's actually designed specifically and built just for one customer at a time. Uh, then the parameters from the data source means that you want to take your feature store as an input view. And the offer matrix, is, we, we used to use the language called product matrix, and we've been working closely with a client who used the word offer, and I think offer is far more relevant in this context, where you've got a lookup that is done based on a product name or whatever it is, and you get a price and other properties that is that has nothing really to do with your, your scoring engine, unless you want to take the price from your offer, recalculate it, and then provide it you know, to whoever is going to be using it. And then the plugins means that you can go and pick up the, the out of the box scoring engines plugin is literally just a hand, handful of lines of code where it, it gets a score, it prioritizes it and it pushes it out to wherever the score is going to be received. But we find that most enterprise and more complex projects require a lot of work to happen around that. So you might end up having say three or four or five models that you want to stack together. You might want to use a binomial to decide if you're going to make a decision about providing somebody with, with a certain set of offers or not, and then you can use a multinamal to decide what the offers are. You can use an autoencoder to rank and sequence it for you. So, so the idea is that you can use a multitude of different models that are stacked together, and you do that in, inside your plugins, your plugins environment. And I'll add some, I'll add an example plugin code in a moment if anybody wanted to see that. We can maybe just show that. But then we've got budget tracking and those kind of tracking. We just used to call it matrix tracking, and that works exactly the same way as you do it with uh, Google AdWords and AdSense. It does exactly the same thing. So that means it's got a multitude of two-dimensional matrices that are high speed, uh, can be accessible at high speed, that you can control whatever numbers are in those budgets. So the budget could be based on a number, a score, a value, or something that comes from either your feature store or any of your other corpora that gets loaded dynamically. You can configure that in any way you like. And then you've got like your whitelisting if you want to do, test, do testing. And then your multi-arm band, and Eric will talk about it in a moment, is there are a number of options that you can use to configure whatever kind of multi-arm band that you want to use. So out of the box, you've got like an Epsilon Greedy or any of the basics, but then there are a number of other ways in which you can configure complex interventions using different ways in which you can do sampling and, and, and test options. Like a lot of the conversations we had earlier, the issue around the short-term data or the dimensions that are available or cultural influences, a lot of that gets tested through this configuration. Eric will show you in a moment what that looks like. So that means you can set up an environment where, where, you, where you can decide what your contextual variables are, what your values are that you want to present, because it could be an offer or a message or a product, whatever that might be. And even if that recommender that recommends something, the output could just be a key to a lookup from your offer matrix to present an offer or whatever it is. So you can make it, it's configurable in any way you like to deal with the nuance of how you, and anyway, so there, there are other features that are currently not on this list that, that, that we will include over the next few releases. So it's all, it's, it's in motion, we're working on it. So what, what I can just quickly do, just for anybody who wanted to, wanted to see that, Eric, if you just want to go out of that project, let me just quickly add what a scoring environment would look like. And I'll just go add it to the plugin. Somebody can just see what it looks like. So we just used to use a language, that like plugin, but again, we've had some great influence from clients that call it post score. So it just means that it's after you've done the scoring in the models, you can then go and, and influence that value of whatever the scoring result is. If you go back, if you just refresh it and you go back into it, and maybe just then go to the plugin, that would be great. So I can just show people how much control they all have. So that means that the API to, to the recommender can be altered. You can define whatever you want the API to be. The API will perform a whole bunch of work for you. And in this case, if you go to the post score and you go into it and you just scroll down a bit, what you'll see this up there, just the top of the class. Sorry, Eric, just at the top, I just want to show the name. So you'll see there's a thing called get post predict. That get post predict essentially gets loaded dynamically as a plugin. So you can create multiple cases and you can even load other cases as scoring, their post predict scoring into your case. And you then have full control over whatever scoring was done by the engine, including what the multi-arm bandit is doing. 
And there's literally this is like the template that comes out of the box that helps you to go and pick up the domain probabilities and the domain names and basically the, the whole scoring environment that you then have access to. And you can decide what you do with the offers that got returned by the predictor. Because what we often find is that that you might have a model that in real time you want to influence it. So there's a thing called inparams, and that is when you pass through the API additional parameters to help to selecting which option is going to be the best. So that means that if you have a recommender that is bolted into an app or a recommender that's bolted into an inbound you know, call center or bolted into some other implementation, you, you can pass parameters other than what you have as part of your channel input when your model was trained to decide what the output is going to be of, the, of that particular recommendation. And then once this is done, then at the top, let me just show them, there are two buttons there. We don't have to do it now, but just to show everybody. There's a button called generate and a button called build. And this further up, I think it's at the top of the, there you see there's generate and there's build. What we do is we set up a deployment pipeline and generate will essentially create the entire code structure and environment that will take the code from the plugin and, and morph it into the basically a deployable environment and the build will push it off to a build server. So the thing is that we don't build servers. So that's normally something that's quite standard. So you might have an AWS pipeline, or you might have a Jenkins or some other server environment that will do the builds for you and will push it from there into your execution, into execution uh, pipeline. But the generate can be done also in a number of ways. The one that we haven't got included here is you can also generate, say, containers, Docker containers, if you wanted to deploy it into Docker. And the idea is it's, it's fully configurable when you get into a way that you want to deploy it in, in your environment. So that means you can keep on experimenting with new ideas and cases continuously. You don't have to worry about the long execution cycles that are normally needed for productionization. And especially if you look at some of the issues that we had today, if you wanted to test different ways of anticipating things. You want to keep the API the recommended the same, so it keeps on recommending something. You want to tweak the approaches that can be dynamically tweaked, and we'll show you now. Or you can even tweak the way in which you want to influence the scores based on other services. So you might call external APIs, or you might get some more data from somebody's you know, social media feed or some other mechanism that will help you to, to sequence what you're going to provide them with. All of that is dynamically determined. And then the part that's not dynamic, when you change your scoring, you generate and you build, then it's normally it, it takes a few minutes and you and you basically in production. Yeah. Okay, Eric, so maybe just uh, show them because I know we're out of time. So maybe to show the dynamic setups. Like the other approach that I mentioned was building building one model for each offer or campaign or whatever it is that you want to recommend. Uh, but that I mean, technology is similar to what we did for the, the multinomial ones. I think given the time, you know, leave that as an exercise for the listener. The third approach of doing a more sort of multi on bandit Bayesian approach is using sort of Thompson sampling with a bit of segmentation to, to rank your offers. So this is one that we set up before. We want to have this something to rank offers, meetup offers. It's our, we first do a bit of setup for it. So it's our meetup recommender. It's going to recommend our offers. And then you say, which production environment do you want it to be sent to? So this is our demo client pulse responder. So you'll have something running and you can change the configuration in that. And where is your training data coming from? So this is our same data set that we had before. What you do then is to add a bit of context, you can basically segment your multi on bandit by a couple of variables. So in this case, we're going to split it by property ownership, you can use this to retrieve all of the potential, all of the potential variables from your feature store that you've linked, just so that you make sure that the variable you want is actually there and retrieve the values for that specific variable. You then choose the approach for your multi bandit. So the Epsilon greedy, binary Thompson sampling, Epsilon greedy with Thompson sampling. You can choose to test options across segments and add a cache if you want people to have some the sort of stability in the office. So once you show them something, if for, for whatever reason you don't want to show them something else for a day or a week or an hour, you can set that cache. And then you set the parameters for that bandit configuration you've chosen. How highly do you want to weight success versus failure? What how often do you want to test across different segments? So yeah, you can make that whatever you wanted it to be. If you have an epsilon, what do you want that to be? And and then you specify the options that you want to, to test, as well as your sort of prior information that you want to put in. So, I mean, this table is obviously only, we haven't populated it with all 10 offers for both options of this variable, but to give you an idea, 
you would say, for the values of our segmentation variables, variable one and two, we have the set of things that we want to recommend. It doesn't need to be the same for, for both. And then if you've chosen the Thompson sampling approach, you set your initial alpha and beta. So alpha, alpha and beta being one and one is a uniform distribution, but if you have prior information, you can include that by tuning these parameters. And then you can also put in sort of a business weighting if you want just to force something to be recommended a lot, you can set that. That's all stored in a, a JSON config file, which gets saved and, and pushed to the runtime. So once you've set that all up, you go go to here and push the updates to your, your client pulse responder, and you'll then be able to have a API interface where you can get ranked offers using that Thompson sampling approach. So that that works quite well. I mean, the one sort of obvious thing that's missing is that if you have a lot of context that matters, a lot of variables that are important, then this can't capture them, which is why we're working on what I spoke, to, what I mentioned before, of using a combining this with a, a regression approach to allow you to use the context. Um, so, I mean, it's called contextual bandits. There's a few different approaches out there, but that's the next enhancement that we'll add to this to combine the first and second approaches <laughs> with the models with this approach of the sort of multi on bandits distribution. So I think that, Eric, maybe just worth mentioning that at the moment, if you wanted to add a lot of context, you can just make sure that it's embedded in your feature store or in your corpora that gets used when you do the scoring. So it's just for the, if you wanted to do complex multi arm bandit um, context, then you, then be busy working on a version that's going to yeah. apply to complex. Yeah, yeah, it's only for this multi arm bandit piece that we were, I mean, obviously you can have yeah. context for, for every other algorithm, it's easy to, to incorporate, yeah. So Eric, I know that, listen, we're out of time. So I was yeah. just thinking, do we, should I quickly show what that scoring looks like on maybe just the real environment where everybody wanted to see that? So when you deploy all of this, the way that you would do it is there's a API that we, we that we publish through the this the scoring engine. It's got a you know quite a rich set of APIs that have that are basically available out of the box that you can use to to, to test any of your scoring environments. The thing that we haven't spoken about today at all that we'll do at some point in the future is we also show how how you how you can use like Jupyter notebooks and so on to go into the detail. But in this example, yeah, if you look at the payload at the bottom here, yeah, and let's say you execute in this case customer 984, what you get is this kind of result. Let me just quickly show you what it looks like if you had to go look at the, the raw payload that, that comes back. What you have is this kind of effect. It shows you if it, we were caching, it shows you if there were an explore exploit, if you had your epsilon greedy turned on. You then have your final result that pushes your final result, whatever this was configured as part of your predefinition. And, and if there were in parameters, in this case, there weren't any. But in this case, it shows the offer and the score that was used. And you'll see that there's an internal mechanism that deals with scores, final score, and modified score. So, the, so it gets used for different kinds of applications, depending on how people want to implement it. But the idea is that, is that every time that you call the API, the payload is standardized so that you know what to do with it. You'll see that in this case, the offer name is just a number, like a zero, one, two. But in most cases, that, that could be a message or it could be a product or it could be a reference point or it could be an action or whatever that you might go and look up or we will do the lookup inside the scoring engine. It gets configured entirely based on the implementation where it's used. And what we're normally trying to get clients to do is to standardize the API calls. So when you do the call to the, to the, to the API endpoint, if this is standardized, it basically means that that you can evolve your models, keep on retraining your models, change things all the time, without ever affecting where it's bolted into the operational environment, because you because you basically keep everything in production 24 by 7. It never goes down. So what we do, some clients have done is they run two separate infrastructure for their scoring engine. One is run basically when you maybe on a, on, on the one day and you're busy updating the next one with new data, new models and you switch across to the new scoring environment while you're busy training the other one, so you rotate. So there are a number of different mechanisms that are being used so that you just you know can stay in production basically 24 by seven. But yeah, that was just an example. So that means that if you pick any other, you know, kind of what you can do is you, you could go and just test some of your results with your different offers and your scores through the Swagger, and then we bolt it normally into load tests environments and so on as well, because you normally have 
a response time of about three, five to 10 milliseconds, depending on what the total score environment looks like.